Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Now, throughout this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. In today's episode, we are honored to be sitting down with the municipality of Kincardine, Ontario, Deputy Mayor Andrea Clark. But before we dive into that interview, 2024 is right around the corner. And for the month of December, we are running a special 2024 New Year's special subscription. For just $24.24 every three months during 2024, immerse yourself in a year of exclusive perks and behind-the-scene access to great content we have in store for you in 2024. So be ready to be part of the national conversation and experience the magic of cross-border interviews. Simply click the Support the Show link on the Cross-Border Interviews website to subscribe to our quarterly holiday special and make your first quarterly donation today. Now, on to our interview with Deputy Mayor Clark. Andrea, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with a general question, and it's the question I've started all my interviews off with every single municipal leader who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Andrea? Uh, well, first, thanks very much, Chris, for having me uh, today. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. In terms of my sense of duty, I'm not sure that there is that one moment where I felt um, the, the calling I think it's been really a part of how I'd like to believe that I've lived my life, which is particularly when we're in a community such as the municipality of King Carden, uh, where it is very much uh, community centered, community focused. I have three young children and I'm a firm believer that you get as much out as you put in. So for me, uh, getting involved, rolling up my sleeves is to a certain extent, perhaps a little bit selfish because I, I get a lot out of that. Was mom and dad political? Did you have sort of a political itch prior to getting involved in local elections? So I actually resided in the UK for a period of time. And I was a counselor over there when I was uh, in the UK. Um, my parents were somewhat political, but really I think the, the thought process behind it for me is the importance of having a voice, the importance of sharing that voice, and it's one thing to be unsatisfied with procedures or processes or things that are being done in your community. And it's another thing to say, let's get in there and try and change that. So from my background, the research on yourself, you you don't run in a first election. You get appointed to Ward 1 after a resignation in 2021. And then in 2022, Ontario goes through an election and then you get reelected. And then in 2023, you become a, a deputy mayor, if I've got my timeline correct there. What was going on in 2021 after that resignation from former Ward 1 councillor that you said, now is the time. This is this is a good opportunity to continue giving back to this new community that I've come back from, because as you said, you were a councillor in the UK for some time as well. So when we arrived back in 2018, I think for a period of time, we were really just adjusting. Uh, we came back, my husband and I, with our three kids. And at that time, we had three children, three and under. Uh, so my focus was really just orienting myself. We, I just started a new practice. Um, and when the opportunity came about in 2021 uh, for the vacancy and the potential appointment, I, I thought this is a perfect time. Um, and also I thought it's for a relatively short period of time. So fully aware that there was going to be an upcoming election just over a year later. Um, it it's, gives you that opportunity to sort of get your feet wet adjust, see if that is something for you, see whether maybe it's a little bit too much with the age of the kids. Um, so it was good. And I, I thought at the end of that period that I was kind of just getting my feet uh, into the system, kind of understanding the processes, understanding a lot of the issues, particularly locally. So definitely thought, yeah, I'm going to try this again. So this is the first time I'm ever going to be able to ask this on this show. And I apologize for not preparing for you for this question, but 
Is there much difference between a counselor in the UK compared to a council in Canada? Because next week after this airs, we have a counselor from the UK coming on, a counselor from New Zealand, a counselor from Australia. But you've lived it. You've lived from one side of the pond to the other. So was there a big uh, sort of difference in what the issues were or how councils are run compared to the UK and in Canada? Well, thank you for the question, Chris. So it, <laughs> it would depend to a certain extent where in the UK you resided. Like the bigger uh, cities, such as Birmingham, had a unitary uh, council. Where I was council, where I served and resided was Lincolnshire. And um, it had different tiers, effectively, of council. So I set up the district uh, level, but there was also the county level. So in terms of the issues, though, uh, many of them are similar, especially in the rural areas. So Lincolnshire was... That's certainly rural. And you dealt with a lot of the issues concerning affordable or attainable housing, issues uh, with regards to development. Um, so they weren't dissimilar. Were they dealt with the same way? No. And I think that was one of the, the things that really came to mind is just the importance of having a variety of views. And if there's one issue that I really advocate on is the importance of having representation on the council. Because the different perspectives really do help um, guide and look at how do we get to a solution um, that is going to be somewhat agreeable, but it may take a different form than we're used to. It may look at a different perspective. You know, the saying is that there's more than one way to peel a banana. And having lived uh, in the UK and looked at very similar issues in some respects, uh, you know that there's different outlooks. Um, so for me, it's been a helpful tool because one of the things I think I have been able to glean over the years uh, is taking a step back, uh, listening when somebody has a suggestion, a viewpoint or, or an opinion and understanding that my perspective, as much as I may think it's correct and the right one, it's only one perspective. And knowing that there are other ways to perhaps reach a resolution or achieve the results we're looking for. You, you've been in a, a council in Kincardine for now roughly two and a half years, uh, approximately. Um, there have been some very big choices that local councils have to make in Canada right now around the affordability issue. How important is it for you as a councillor, as now deputy mayor, to go into that council meeting prepared on every single issue that is presented to you in that agenda package with those sort of ideas of how you're going to vote, but not cement it in it because you may hear something that comes up during a council meeting that may sway you to a different opinion that you originally thought you were going to have? I think this is a great follow on point from from what I was just suggesting. So clearly reading the materials that's given to you prior to council meetings is extremely important. It's a part of what your role is. Understanding the reports, um, having an idea and an understanding about the recommendations and perhaps why that, that, why that is the recommendation. But equally, a really uh, significant part of democracy is the transparency of the discussion that takes place in the council chamber. So you really can't go in there uh, with a fettered discretion as to this is the way it's got to be done. Because that comes back to my point that I may go in there having read the material thinking, yeah, I could see this is probably the better option. But after discussion, um, I may be swayed. And it's important to understand that the, the real essence, not only of democracy and, and understanding that transparency of those discussions, but of having representation at the council table from different demographics is that you'll get those different perspectives. And that is important because that not only helps to uh, form your, your perspective and your viewpoint when coming towards a decision, uh, and even if my my decision remains perhaps as it, it started off at the outset, I may take a very different stance on it. So I may come to a, a situation where I have to vote one way or the other, but understanding that the impact still may be greater on certain demographics that I hadn't considered before. 
How important? Because as someone who's worked in municipal government prior, myself, uh, I know those packages sort of are what the administration is looking for. But you as councillor have to look and as the deputy mayor and as council have to look at every issue and see it as a town issue, as a municipal issue. While you have your viewpoint, your perspective, is it also imperative to go out and talk to people about what the decisions that are going to be presented in front of council? Because you may have your perspectives, but there may be people who may not be engaged as I am or as you are in local government. So getting out and talking to people gets them sort of involved and gets their perspectives heard from a person like yourself. Absolutely, Chris. Um it's so important that uh, residents also realize the power of their voice and the importance of their voice and their opinions at the council table. Uh, as I've said, you know, if there are issues that are not being dealt with to your satisfaction, it's very important that that is expressed because there's no other way for us to know. And just as I spoke about the council table and the benefit of individuals coming with their own perspective, that's equally, if not more so, for the residents that are coming forward who it's going to directly, whatever decisions we make are going to directly impact them. That's the beauty of municipal politics is um, it's not something that you kind of feel in, in a month or two months. These are issues that are, are right before you every day. Uh, and for me, that's one of the, the reasons I went into municipal politics is because these are the everyday issues that have to be dealt with. You, you're right. You are the government of proximity, and that means that you are more uh, close. You're closer to the general public than your MPP or your MP. You don't go off to Queen's Park to do your job. You don't go off to Ottawa to do your job. So you're in your community 24 seven when you're doing your job and you make decisions. People in, are impacted the next day. When we talk about engagement, though, when you're talking to residents, do they understand the jurisdictional roles and responsibilities that the municipality has compared to the provincial and federal government? Or as, as councillor, as deputy mayor, do you see your role in addressing all issues from residents, even if it is another level of government? Or do you sort of say to them, that's a question for your MPP, that's a question for your MP, or do you sort of try to take it and then work with the other levels of government to address these issues that you're hearing from your residents? I think that's a question that is integrated on many levels. So do residents understand the various jurisdictions? I think for the most part, yes, they do. It doesn't mean that they don't want the problem solved though. And I'm not <laughs> certain that uh, residents are that bothered who solves the problem. They just want a resolution. So they may very well understand that that's not in your purview in municipal government, but equally they need to get it resolved. You know, affordable or attainable housing. Um, the issues concerning the difficulties of uh, physician recruitment. Um, when you're a, a parent with a sick child at home, I'm not sure that you give a lot of thought as to uh, whose responsibility is this. It just needs to be resolved. We need to have sufficient doctors and medical care. But we need to ensure that um, all of those who wish to remain living within our municipality can do so in an affordable manner. So to answer your question, yes, I do think they're aware of jurisdictional um, mandates, but equally, the end result for a lot of individuals, understandably, is to find a resolution. Uh, your second question concerning what do we do if we're a municipal in municipal politics or a politician, how do we deal with that? Well, I think you're right. It's, it's um, in different manners. So it could be something along the lines of advocacy and advocating to the higher tiers of government, the other levels uh, for attainable or affordable housing or the need to uh, help with the recruitment of physicians and medical care. Um, it could be more of a hands-on approach where we, you look at uh, partnering uh, with nonprofits or county in terms of trying to address some of the housing uh, issues and affordability uh, with housing. So I, once again, it's it's a prime example of where there probably isn't one solution, uh, but knowing that there are, are different ways and different methods that we can at least not only engage the residents, but work towards uh, trying to address the issues that remain outstanding. Because as I've said, I, they're more concerned, as I would be, 
with getting a resolution as to whose plate it falls on. Um, we're, we're talking about the issues a little bit right here, and I want to turn to segment two, and I want to talk about the municipality as a whole. But before I do that, I want to preface this first question with the, uh, by saying this. This is a conversation between the deputy mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a policy of council. This is not even a direction of council. This is the deputy mayor's opinion and a conversation between the cross-border interviews and her. This is nothing else but that. I just want to preface that because I will get emails no matter what I say there. I want to start with a simple question, but an important question to start this topic off. And that is, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues, because you've talked about a few already, facing the municipality of Kincardine today? Thanks for the question, Chris. Um, I think it's fair to say that depending on the demographic that you're in, um, will rank the priority of the issues uh, that need addressing. So I'm always very careful and somewhat reserved when I say this is the largest issue, uh, because I, I do think uh, different groups will have different priorities in terms of those issues. So I don't know if that we have a, an overall umbrella. I can certainly talk about some of the, the, the larger issues within the municipality. Uh, one, as I've said, is the affordable and attainable housing. Not something unique, certainly, to our municipality, and in fact, it's not something unique to our country. Um, it, it was an issue when I was a council councillor back in Lincolnshire, uh, affordable and attainable housing. Uh, very um, precarious as to how we get to where we need to be with the housing levels and the housing supply, whose responsibility that falls on, how it's funded. Uh, really, it requires uh, various levels uh, of government to be working together in order to uh, find a solution. So. Uh, that is one issue, the, the housing issue. And I think um, I'm fair to say that, you know, it, although, as previously stated, it may not fall within our, our purview, we're very aware of it. And it, our role may be something along the lines of advocacy. It, our role may be something along the lines of even education. When development um, applications come before the municipality, some of them um, are a bit challenging to deal with because you have a municipality um, where it, it it's rural for the most part, or certainly uh, more rural than a lot of other areas. And to suddenly have a large amount of development um, being proposed or going, um, going forward isn't accepted by everyone uh, as willingly as uh, perhaps it's anticipated. So you have the challenges just even within that. So there is an element of not only advocacy, but educating that there is certainly a need to increase the supply of housing. And the, the issue about attainable or affordable housing may be a separate issue. We we're just talking about increasing that supply and that in itself um, has to be navigated with the sensitivities that I completely understand when it, you know, individuals are saying this area doesn't suit that type or that, um, that type of density that's being proposed. So that's understandable. And, you know, we're dealt with, how do we balance that out? How do we um, navigate those challenges where we know we need housing, uh, we know the benefits um, with uh, developing more densely populated areas, um, but equally uh, we understand that those who reside there, uh, that may not have been their first choice. That's usually not why you go to a rural area is for, um, you know, all these condos to be built. That, that's so I, I, I understand that, and it's always a, a challenge. And that's where the educational piece, in my, uh, in my view, comes in, that it increases the tax base. There's an importance because we want to increase the level of services. Uh, we want to address other issues. And in order to do that, um, there needs to be a method for us to, to effectively uh, ensure that we can fund that. Now, I can imagine while your tenure on uh, Kincardine Council has been relatively two and a half years is relatively short in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know that you're not going to please 100 percent of the people on council uh, uh, with the decisions you make. And you have to make some very tough choices, especially around housing, especially around affordable housing and bringing in these uh, new uh, building permits to build more housings for your community. How do you do that? How do you make that tough decision to balance the needs of the individual with the needs of the community? Because 
it, it often they don't seem to work hand in hand, but sometimes they do. But for big issues like housing, it seems like there's always some people who say, I just want my community to stay the way it is. Thanks for the question, Chris. I think one of the um, key factors that I extrapolate even outside of the, the core issue of housing is the importance to listen. Um, and that's when residents are raising a concern, when they're red flagging something, it's really important to step back and take that um, that view of, let me hear what you're saying, because what they're saying is going to be valid, not only to them, but in my experience, usually any argument, even if I disagree with it, will have validity to it at some point. And there is the, I'd like to think that my, my approach has been, is there a way that, um, there can be some sort of mid ground where I appreciate um, the concerns that are being raised. How do we how do we address those concerns uh, while still addressing the need that need that has to be met? And it's not that isn't necessarily an easy way uh, forward. But I think if we step away from the immediate scenario, um, and we will all go in with our own view and direction as to what we think is the right method. Um, some of us will say, yeah, it's to just build, build, build. Others will say, oh, you know, we, we need to step back, particularly in the rural areas. And everyone will have their own kind of viewpoint on what the best way for it is. However, somewhere in there, my belief is on most issues, there is that agreeable point. There's the point of this is what I would want in my ideal world, uh, but this is the point that I can live with and accept. And I think that is, if you want a thriving, successful community, I think we need to try and find that point um, where we say, none of us are probably going to get exactly what we want. We need to live together and work together. Let's find something that is workable for all of us and helps to address the greater need of the municipality. Now, you, you've just mentioned a few, well, two big macro issues, affordable housing, physician recruitment, two very big macro issues that municipalities are dealing with. But if I go to your municipality tomorrow and I ask 100 people their top priority, their top issue in their community, they're going to give me a range of issues that they believe are, is important to them. Uh, you know, as well as I do, that municipalities cannot run deficits, so it's hard sometimes to say no to people because, unfortunately, things just aren't in the budget, whether it be a new sidewalk in front of this area of the community or a new road upgrade because the potholes that are in front of someone's house. How do you balance the micro issues with the macro issues? Because individually, people want to feel like they're taxes are being spent on them as well as the community. So how do you see that your role in balancing what the individual wants with the realities of the financial realities that the municipality is under? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, um, Chris. And I think there has to be a focus on um, the perhaps top three, four, five priorities that the municipality has to deal with. I mean, we know as uh, our municipality, you know, infrastructure uh, is always uh, one of the, the big issues. It's perhaps not the most glamorous, but, you know, that that's it has to be dealt with. That's, that certainly is in our, our purview. And around the time of budget, um, it's always challenging because just like you're saying, there will be individuals who want to see various services offered and we have to balance that with, uh, I appreciate that you want that service. However, uh, we're trying to ensure that um, we can keep uh, taxes at a reasonable uh, rate. Like that that has to come from somewhere else, somewhere else. And that goes back, if I'm circling back around to the educational element of it, you know, well, how else can we generate revenue? And uh, certainly through, through development is one, like increase your tax base. Um, it's, so sometimes it, it's something of that nature which takes pointing out that, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, but in order for us to perhaps have that revenue where we're increasing the services or we're able to offer uh, more, we're going to have to try and find the revenue. And um, I, Are people I okay part, with that? I was going to say, I think for the most part, Chris, 
people understand that. It's not to say that you don't have your priorities. I think, as you've said, you ask 100 people, you'll get 100 different priorities. You you know, we uh, in the municipality had a relatively um, large, what we call the downtown day construction element going on for the majority of this year. So you ask um, the retailers uh, what their priority is, and it's certainly to get um, to get traffic back through um, the the downtown core. It's to ensure that um, there is support for the local economy, and you can happily see that there is a lot of merit in that and validity um, in regards to we need to support our local economy. Uh, I often have said that you know. Our, our local businesses, not just in our municipality, but up and down this country is, is the backbone of our economy. They're, they sponsor our local sports teams. Uh, they're the ones we go to for various sponsorships and they're the ones that are there. And undoubtedly they've had a rough few years, uh, not only the pandemic, but of course, after that we've had a, what we call, or what we have termed as a downtown dig, which is um, a lot of upheaval in that, uh, in the core. And so businesses were impacted. But we are a community that wholeheartedly tends to support um, our local economy. So I always encourage that because, once again, it is important uh, and it keeps us cohesive uh, as a unit. Um, you bring up a good topic, and I, I I always get accused of only talking about the negative issues when I talk about municipalities. So I'm going to flip the question a little bit here, and I'm going to ask, what does Kincardin get right? What does it do right from your perspective? When you speak to other municipalities across Ontario, across Canada, when you talk to councillors, what do you tell them that Kincardin does right in your community? Well, I can do this. I can do a direct comparison because um, I've had the opportunity of living at various in various locations, various countries, and there is no other community that I have lived in where my husband, myself, my kids have felt so welcomed and where there has been such a genuine sense of community. Um, we have often been asked, my, my husband and I, when we first came here, you know, do you have any relatives in Kincardin? And over the years, we love to give the answer, you know, we have no blood relatives in Kincardin, but we have a lot of family. It is a community in the gen most genuine and sincere sense of the word. And if you're looking at how do you build um, a successful municipality, what I say is, focus on what you have and how that can be enhanced and enriched and less so on what you don't have. And there is so much uh, beauty in King Carden, um, not only just with the the people, which I, I, as I've said, it's it's the most phenomenal place that we've ever resided, um, but with the, the aesthetics. And if you're looking at uh, those sort of doing a comparison of successful municipalities, I think one of the things you'll see are those that not only focus on future planning, and in order to get that right, you do need a cross section of the demographics engaging in future planning, but also looking at what do you have? Like, what is the, the assets of your municipality that you can really enhance? Um, and one of the things for me has been, it's interesting, like we're compared often to other places and, and we still have that um, sort of smaller feel. You go down, the main streets and you'll have independent um, retail providers. But the great thing about that is they're they're your friends, they're the people that you know. They're, you know, they they show up with a smile even throughout the pandemic and in difficult scenarios. I think that is very unique in this day and age. Um, so of course, there are other benefits about having bo uh, big box retailers, but I actually think when I go through the municipality, and whether it's in um, a Tiverton or there is a, a you know a local lovely coffee shop that you can sort of stop in it and casually read a book, or it, th those are gems that really do need to be highlighted because in the day and age where we live in a culture where you don't even know your neighbors, that is not our municipality. 
Um, it, it seems like you, you you want to talk about my favorite subject here, and that is tourism. So I want to talk about it a little bit because <laughs> let's talk about some of these hidden gems in the municipality of Kincardine if you want, if we can. Um, as I've said on this show, if you come on my show, I will come to your community and I will spend my economic dollars. And we are doing a big southwestern uh, swing in 2024 because we have a few municipalities that we have to go visit. So Kincardine is now on that list. What are some of the highlights? What are some of the hidden gems? You talk about the coffee shop. But what other other hidden gems in King Carden are there that tourists need to see? <laughs> okay, so I, I I mean I say the beaches, but I think <laughs> that that is a given. I'm not sure how hidden that is, but um, undoubtedly we have I, I would say the, the most beautiful beaches. Perhaps that's a little bit biased. I don't know, Chris, um, but we have a, a large tourist. Uh, population that comes in um, for the summer months. So the, the beaches are there. We have walking trails and, and the trails which have uh, the natural beauty. Um, we have the lighthouse, the museums, the Victoria Art Gallery. Um, and then I had obviously just described the general feel within the community where you're walking along and you have your independent local retailers. Um, you have the parks. I think one of the the key features for me with regards to the municipalities, just how much you can do outdoors. Um, and that's, of course, ideal within the summer months. Um, my kids like it as well within the winter. We, we do a lot of tobogganing and um, walking the trails as well. So that for me has been a real pull. Um, it's great to get the kids off the screens and have some time outdoors. Um, so I have one final question for you because you have sort of answered my other question in that statement there. Um, but I have one final question. It's the most important question I ask on this show. And you've kind of sort of encompassed it throughout our interview, but I want to sort of specifically get to the crux of it. What makes the municipality of Kindergarten such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? If I had to summarize that I would say it is that sense of community it's very difficult to perhaps put it in words um, but it's one of those places where you come in to live to work and you get pulled in to the community there is a huge sense of generosity uh, with time we heavily rely on um on volunteers within the municipality. Certainly a lot of the organizations wouldn't be able to function without volunteers. And to know that people are so generous in giving with their time is pretty unbelievable, especially in this day and age where people are so so busy with so many other things. Um, but also just the, the genuine sense that people want to live there. You, you, you come, you live in King Garden, um, you want to live there, uh, you're welcomed in the community. And as a result of that, my experience has been, uh, you feel a sense of having to contribute. And that's not a bad thing, but you know that uh, in order to, to keep the wheel functioning, you have to give your bit. Like if each one of us can do our part, uh, we make the community so much better to live in. I want to thank you. I appreciate that answer and I appreciate your time today. I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and talk about your community. You have painted a vibrant picture and I'm so looking forward to visiting yeah, King Carden in 2024 and visiting potentially old friends that I went to university with who live in your community. So uh, hopefully if you have time when I'm down there, I, we can stop and grab a cup of coffee and we can go explore those beaches together. Oh, for sure, Chris. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your unwavering interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you have gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavors to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. We couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light onto the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes. 
Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can help deliver the kind of content you have come to expect from us. Now, we're thrilled that local leaders from coast to coast to coast in Canada are coming on the show to share their story with us, each with their own unique perspectives and experiences. So mark your calendars and keep those notifications on because there's a wealth of knowledge waiting for you just around the corner. Once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.